First United Methodist Church, Pastor John here, and we are so glad to be with you, and we are so excited that you have decided to, to join us for really what is our, our, our very first service on, on Facebook Live, and we're just honored and privileged that, that you would uh, spend some time with us this morning during what is really an interesting time uh, in our country and in our world. Absolutely. Yeah, right now in the time in our service, we're typically doing announcements. Uh, as you may have guessed, most of the things that you're used to happening aren't happening, at least here in person. Um, and we want to just we want you to know that we care about your spiritual growth. We care about your community of faith people together. Uh, and a lot of these opportunities that we do face to face so often are going to be done online. So uh, make sure you stay tuned in here to the Facebook. Make sure you stay tuned. Uh, to YouTube, there'll be more info kind of coming around, but we really, uh, we couldn't let a Sunday go by without gathering with our church family and worship. Even if we can't gather here in this building, we can gather online. Yeah, and we just want you to know that, you know, during this time, we're continuing to hold you up in prayer. Uh, we want you to know that the church has not stopped. The church is not dead, and that God can still use these means during these times of uncertainty to reach people, to touch people, and to continue to advance his kingdom in the world. So we're just so glad that you have joined us. Uh, we continue to encourage you to, to join us as many Sundays as we, we need to do this. Uh, continue to go online and, uh, and, and see, look for ways that, that you can continue to uh, be a worshipful community during this time. And we're so excited for this, uh, this hour of worship. Uh, we're going to do uh, uh, opening scripture here. Josh is going to read for us. And then we're going to have some familiar songs for you. And we encourage you to sing along with as well with us as the best you can. We're going to turn it to Josh and he's going to read the opening scripture for us. Absolutely. Pastor John uh, asked me to kind of share a scripture from, from my heart, especially during this time. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of encouragement in Psalms, but I found a lot of encouragement from this verse in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 43 uh, we're seeing the Lord talk to the nation of Israel. We're seeing him talk about what's been done. We're seeing him talk about who he is for them, how he is their Lord. He opened a way through the waters. He made a dry path through the sea. I called forth a mighty army of Egypt with all the chariots and horses, and I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. We're talking about the exodus of uh, coming from Egypt. And then in Isaiah 43, uh, verse 18, he says, but forget all that. So in other words, take pause. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in a dry wasteland. And as I look at that scripture and I let it meditate in my heart, I'm just saying in this time, how beautiful it is that there has been a way made. For us to worship that there has been a way in this place where we feel so alone i know that in my house as we have been a family of four that we have felt isolated we felt distant but there's a way that we get to get together and worship and so like pastor john was saying i encourage you this morning uh to, to worship wholeheartedly with us man I, I know it's tempting for me if i watch church online it's tempting for me to kind of scroll around facebook and i encourage you just Back that computer away. Just let it play. Put it on the TV if you need to. Put that phone down. Put your magazine down. Put, the, put, put whatever's in your hands down. Because if we're going to gather and worship, God has made a way for that to happen. Sing as loud as you need to in your living room, man. Make sure your neighbors can hear you. Because we're coming together as the family of God here in this place today. Even though we can't physically be together right now because of what's going on in the world, God says, I'm doing a new thing. I will make a pathway through the wilderness and I'll create rivers in a dry wasteland. So even though we're not here all together, we're not giving each other hugs, we're still a community. We're still a faith body and we're so excited for you to join us this morning. And so with that being said, we're going to go into a time of worship. We've got some uh, awesome people with us. We've got our pianist, uh, our flautist, and our singer. We have Jeff, Susie, and Miss Laura. And so please join us as we sing together. These hymns should be familiar to you. Amen. Good morning. We are so happy that you are joining us in worship wherever you are at this morning. And if you have uh, read your upper room this morning, if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. There's a, a verse that stands out in there that was used. 
from Psalm chapter 3, verse 3, it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. And knowing that the Lord is still in control and always will be in control, we can sing together where you are at, it is well with my soul. still be well with your soul, and God can still do some amazing and powerful things. Uh, we're going to go out now into uh, this giving moment, and while we can't give here uh, in the church, we just want to remind you and encourage you that uh, you can still give during this time. You know, even though the church is not functioning as it normally does, uh, 
we still need your support. We still need your tithes. We still need your prayers. We still need your best offerings. And so we just want to encourage you to remember to do that throughout the week. You can mail in your checks. You're still able to drop them by the church office. The church office is open. And there's also going to be an online way of giving as well. And we're going to send out that information a little bit later today or tomorrow. We're going to put that in an email. We'll put that uh, on, on a link so you can give online as a way to continue to financially supporting the church during this time. And I pray that uh, you, know, you would just continue to consider how you can support us uh, as we continue in this, in this season. Uh, we're going to go into a time of prayer as well. And on the Facebook app, if you're watching, uh, you, feel free to type in your prayer request uh, for us to be able to know. Uh, we might not get to them right now, but during the week, we can be lifting you up in prayer. And we can also feel free to type in your glory sightings as well. Uh, I know someone earlier this week told me that if we were doing glory sightings, they wanted to praise that they had a, a wonderful wedding in the family. And, and uh and someone was able to uh, still get married over this, uh, this last week, even in the midst of this chaos. And so we praise God for, for how uh, he can still move in this time. So send in your prayer request. Send in your glory sightings. Uh, we'll get to those. And uh, we're, we're just, uh, we invite you to continue to interact with one another. This may be a time for, for you to pray for one another during this time. So click that in the comment section and we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to get to that. Uh, we're going to go into a time of prayer now, and so I just invite you to join me as you are able to. And let's just lift up uh, one another and our country and our world during this time. And let's pray for God to do something amazing and miraculous that we've never seen before. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, these are unprecedented times. I know for, like myself, that I've never lived through something like this. The panic, the chaos, and the fear. And God, for so many of us, it is, it's affecting us emotionally, mentally, physically. God, worry is at an all-time high right now. Lord, as we sit in the sanctuary, it even feels rather odd. But, Lord, but we are reminded that you are still on the throne. We're reminded that you are still Lord. And knowing that, having that comfort, having that peace, transcends all worry, all anxiety, and all fears that we might have during this time, that God, even though we cannot worship physically together, we know that nothing, no power in heaven or hell, God, nothing in life or death or principality can stop your church from continuing to be who you have called us to be. And nothing, Lord, can separate us from your love. So we pray for that, Lord, in this time and in this place. God, we pray for our medical workers, for our doctors, for people in the hospitals who are dealing with this in the most dramatic and tangible and real ways. We pray for our first responders. We pray for our government officials. We pray for those who are in charge of making those extremely difficult decisions about how to best deal with this coronavirus. And we ask that you would give them the wisdom and the strength and the courage to do what needs to be done. God, I step out in faith and Lord, I pray that you would end this. That in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator of heaven and earth, who is over all and in all and works through all, that we would begin to see a, an end to this. That you would start to provide healing, Lord. That you would make a way for the fears and the anxieties and the worries that are so prevalent now, you would make a way for those to, to cease. 
And God, I pray this would be a reminder of how much we need you as well and how much we need each other. Lord, it's in these times when it's extremely tempting to isolate and God, I don't believe that you call us to do that. But I believe that you call us to continue to carry on as a community of faith, as people, whether it be online or with telephone calls or notes or chat rooms or online groups. God, I pray that you would still remind us that we can be together and we can be with one another. So we ask in the name of our almighty Father and Lord Jesus that you would come in the midst of this. You would give us peace that we cannot find anywhere else but in you. And we would hold on to the hope that you have given us we would pray together as one community the prayer that you have so faithfully taught us to pray as one. And I invite you at home to pray this along with me, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from our evil. For thine is the king and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, we're going to get right into our, our sermon this morning. And uh, I just want to say again, it's, it's so good to be with you all. And as many of you know, uh, I have been away for the past few weeks and I've been on leave to be with my family as we, uh, as we welcome our newest addition, Nolan Lucas Brewster, into the family. And uh, we've been so excited to be able to spend time with him, and it's been joyful to be with him. Uh, and I thought I was going to get to come back and uh, worship with my church family after being away from these three weeks. But as it turns out, uh, it's just not possible right now. But I'm reminded that, as we talked about before, that nothing can really stop the church from meeting. Nothing can really stop the church from happening because wherever God is, wherever two or more are gathered, uh, that's where we can find God in our midst. And so I'm with you today. Uh, I'm in church with you today. And I am so grateful to be a part of your lives and in, in this community of faith with us. Uh, right now, we're in a season of Lent. And uh, in this, in First Monticello, uh, we have been working on a sermon series, or we've been going through a sermon series called Giving Up. And, and during Lent, we've been exploring really these, these different themes in our lives as ways to, to give up our lives for the sake of God, to draw closer to God. Lent is often a practice where we will fast or we will give up something in our lives in order to be able to surrender to God in real and tangible ways. And we see Jesus do this in the beginning of his ministry when he, when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights as he began to prepare for his public ministry. Uh, we see Jesus give up his life on the cross, a sacrifice on the cross. And so we're reminded during this Lent season that when we give up our lives to God, we draw closer to God. We take on more of the cruciform uh, lifestyle of Jesus. And so Lent is very powerful for us, and it's a rem healthy reminder for us of, of what Easter is all about. Uh, in today's lesson, we're, doing so we're going to talk about something that's probably really hard for a lot of us to give up. At least I know it is for me in my life. We're talking about giving up our enemies. Giving up our enemies. And so I'm going to say a prayer for us as we begin, and then we're going to jump right into uh, our lesson in our, in, our, in our sermon this morning. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we are reminded that during this Lent season, we're called to give up. Give up our fears, give up our anxieties, give up our expectations, give up control. And God, today we're going to learn a little bit about what it means to give up our enemies. 
So would you help us with this, Lord? Would you remind us that it is love that will truly get us through this season and every season of our lives. So come, Lord Jesus, come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So when I think about giving up our enemies, you know, one of the first people I think of is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, he's one of, probably one of the most well-known uh, people in the history of our country, if not the world. Uh, during his short life, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King provided the tremendous, tremendous amount of hope and healing and an ethic of love uh, for us, uh, especially in the midst of a very broken and, and fragmented nation. Uh, really, through his inspiring speeches and, and his words, uh, we were reminded that love is the way for us. That as a people, as a nation, if we don't grow in our love, we stand little chance of growing together. And if you read any of his letters, if you read any of his sermons and listen to any of his speeches, it, it becomes very evident that Dr. Martin Luther King, he not only believed this mentally, but he lived it out in his life. This was the, the ethic of his life. Uh, I've read a, a biography or two about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and one of the most amazing stories that I've heard about him was a time when he was actually in a bookstore and he was nearly stabbed to death. Uh, he was at a book signing and he was signing a book for some people and a person came up to him and asked, are you Dr. Martin Luther King? And he said, yes, I am. And the individual took out a letter opener and stabbed him in the chest. And when he was rushed to the hospital, uh, the doctor said that if that letter opener would have gone a millimeter or two in any different direction, that he would have never survived that incident. He would have never made it to the hospital alive. He would have bled to death right then and there. And, and I think many people would probably think that, that this incident probably would have caused a lot of hatred, a lot of anger in his life, a lot of resentment towards the other. But we know that his life, and in his life, he continued to preach this ethic of love, this ethic of love for God and for his neighbor. And we see this over and over again in the Gospels. In fact, Jesus takes it to an even further level than we probably aren't comfortable with. Uh, Jesus says that you have heard that it was said to love your neighbors and hate your enemy. He said, but I tell you, I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. To love your enemies and pray for those who who persecute you. Wow. It's an amazing command, and one that I don't think we're very good at. You see, if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking, now why did Jesus have to go and say that? Gosh, it's hard enough for me to love those people who are in my inner circle, or the people that I associate with every day. How am I supposed to love my enemies? In fact, if we were to take a poll right now on and on the, in the Facebook nation and really uh, in our church community, uh, I imagine that there's at least one person in all of our lives that we just have a really difficult time loving. It might be a family member. It might be a relative. Maybe it's a, it's a friend or an acquaintance or someone that we just have to see a lot. In fact, I bet you if we're really honest, we're really glad that we have caller IDs on our phone sometimes because we are just really glad that we don't have to answer that one call when that person tries to reach out to us. We just hit the reject, or we say, we're just gonna let it go to voicemail. It's really difficult to love. We are not really good at that. And Jesus knows this about us. And, and he knows that we tend to not love him and our Christian brothers and sisters as well. And we see this in our scripture passage this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 37 through 44. And listen to what this says. It says that when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that he had done or they had seen. And they began to shout, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Then listen to what Jesus said. He says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when you, when your enemies, will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So this is a passage that reminds us of how quickly we can make enemies out of one another, and especially out of Jesus, even though he was trying to come and help us to understand the love of the Father. Now, like every passage, I think we need to give a little context to what's going on here. Now, Jesus is just entering into the city gates of Jerusalem. In fact, this is right before the Passion narrative, when Jesus is going to be turned over to the, to the officials to be hung and crucified on a cross. And, and Jesus, in, in some text, is, is riding in on a donkey, and so we know we're getting really closer to this, to this, uh, this Easter season. And the disciples are shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In other words, they're praising Jesus because of who he is and what they have done for the people and what they have done for the nation. And the text says they're praising him because of all of his miracles that he's done, all of his healings that he's done, all of the good works and the good deeds that he has done, the ethic of love that he has shared amongst the people. He's expanding the kingdom of God by sharing this radical notion of God's love for, for the people. And we see, we see Paul talk about this in his letters when he says, it's neither nor slave nor free person, Jew or Gentile, male or female, all will experience the love of God. And that's what Jesus is doing by performing these miracles and these, these healings. He's, he's expanding the kingdom in these radical ways. And guess what? The Pharisees don't like it one bit. Teacher, order your disciples to stop, they say. Teacher, tell your disciples to stop praising you. Because we can't stand it. We can almost imagine the Pharisees are, 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 are fuming in anger because all of the attention is on Jesus. And it's not on them. How often do we resonate with that? Now this probably isn't too surprising uh, when we look at who the Pharisees were and we look and we learn a little bit about them. Uh, the Pharisees were the religious rulers of the day. Uh, they were people who had incredible zeal for the law and upholding the law. In fact, the Pharisees were the people who were most resistant to Jesus' ministry and what he was doing in the world. You see, where Jesus was trying to offer compassion and hope to the people, it was the Pharisees who were always trying to promote the stringency of the law. When Jesus was trying to perform miracles and heal people, it was the Pharisees who were more concerned with really these purity laws and, and making sure people were staying clean and distancing themselves from other people. When Jesus was trying to share about the love of God, it was the Pharisees who were trying to promote the love of the law. So whereas Jesus was trying to expand the wideness, embracing the wideness of the kingdom, it was the Pharisees who were trying to embrace a relationship with the law. And this might be what Jesus is talking about when he says he came into Jerusalem and he wept over the city walls. That Jesus knew that his very own people had rejected him. And at the same time, they were rejecting God. In fact, if you look at Matthew's Gospel, there's a parallel story uh, that is very similar to this one. That really shows the, the depravity of the situation and the gloom of the situation. Uh, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. 
See, Matthew is saying that when God is trying to send a messenger into the world, a messenger of hope, a messenger of, of grace and love, the people are more likely to reject him than embrace him. And Jesus is saying, this is what you're doing to me. And you're trying to push me out. And so he's weeping over the city that's rejecting their king. John 1, verses 9 to 11 says this. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. You see, at some point, the people of Jerusalem made Jesus, their Savior, their enemy. It became easier to crucify Jesus than to worship Jesus. And whether we want to admit it or not, we tend to do the same thing. And we tend to do the same thing to one another. See, our history tells us that at our worst, we tend to treat each other pretty poorly the same way that Jesus' people treated him. In fact, if we look over the past 200 years of our history, we see that we, uh, we fall pretty short of the glory of God. Uh, example, for during, during World War II, 17 million Jews were killed because of their ethnicity and their religious beliefs. During the Civil War, 600,000 people fought and were killed in battle all because of political differences. In 2019, there were over 400,000, or sorry, 400 mass shootings. In political circles, we tend to demonize and to push away and to call people with different thoughts and affiliations as opponents and nuisances and, dare I say, even our enemies. In our churches, we tend to look at one another at least nowadays, our, our people, our clergy, and our bishops, we tend to look at them with a lot of skepticism. Rather than embracing them as brothers and sisters in Christ, we say things like, well, do they agree with me? Or do they think like I think? Do they have the same convictions I do? If they don't, then I must oppose them, or I must resist them, or I must fight them. And I gotta admit, I've, I've done this as well. I've been on the receiving end of this as well. I remember one time I was in a small group, and we were discussing a, a hot topic of the day, and I was in a group of people, and we were, we were talking about uh, just one of the hot topics of the day, and we were all going around sharing, and I shared some of my thoughts about it. But I remember at the end of, of sharing that I told them, you know, no matter where we fall in this, I have a tremendous amount of respect, and I can always respect the person's opinion, and and, and, and their beliefs, and I, I still believe there's room where we can be a community in the midst of this disagreement. And without missing a beat, this person kind of crossed their arms like this, kind of gave me that snarl, and he looked at me and he said, I can't respect any man. I can't respect any man who disagrees with me about this issue. And it was right then and there, I felt it. I went from friend to foe. I felt like I became his enemy. And it just reminded me of how easily we can do that, how we can turn friend into foe, family member into rivalry, brother and sister in Christ, into our enemies. But thank goodness, the story tells us, that this isn't where it ends. You see, in Christ, we have someone who will still consider us his friends, Jesus, friend of sinners. We are told that even though we have become enemies of God, that Jesus refused to become nothing less than our rock, our redeemer, and our savior. Paul writes, for if while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life. You see, sometimes giving up our enemies, I think, means that we have to choose to see the best in one another. To give up our enemies means we need to look past the surface and to recognize that we're all made in the image of God. 
To give up our enemies means knowing there isn't a single person in this world that Christ would not die for. And to give up our enemies means we must choose the ways of Jesus, even if it's costly. Thomas Merton writes this, The love that is essential for true Christian life involves participation in all the struggles, all the problems, and all the aspirations of the church. Let me say that again. It involves participation in all the struggles, all the problems, and all the aspirations of the church. So I want to ask you today, friends, what does it look like for you to give up your enemies? What resentment do you need to, to let go? What battle do you need to stop fighting? How can you begin to be an agent of healing and reconciliation in your life? How can you love the people that Jesus weeps over and that he desperately loves? You see, I'm reminded of something that Christianity is the only religion in the world that calls, us, that calls us to love our enemies. It's the only religion in the world that calls us to love people who are our enemies. And in this light, when we do that, I have discovered something amazing. That Dr. Martin Luther King's truth and his ethic of love, when we love our enemies, becomes really real for us. He said that hate is too great a burden for us to take on. And so it's better for us to simply to just love. So I want to encourage you today to love. And I think if you do that, you'll find that your life is a lot more joyful. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. And so Lord, we come before you now, and we're reminded that you have called us to love extravagantly in this season. Lord, to love those who are different than us, to love those who are our enemies. And God, uh, even in the midst of isolation and distancing and quarantine, God, and we still are called to find ways to love one another. So would you help us to do that, Lord? And would you show us that extravagant love that we have all been invited to receive through your Son, Jesus Christ? Amen. Well, we're going to turn now to our closing hymn. And it's a song that's familiar to many of you. We're going to sing Amazing Grace together this morning. So I invite you to sing as you're able. It's going to be four verses of Amazing Grace. Thank you. 
friends from myself, and Josh, and Laura, and Susie, and Jeff. Again, we just thank you for joining us, and we encourage you to continue to uh, join us every week if you're able to as, as we worship God and we continue to be the church. Amen. And hey, don't forget to share uh, this service. It'll be available to share after the fact. We saw, I think, 70, over 70 people watching this. And we know a lot of you are with your families and you're worshiping together. And so we're uh, very excited that we're still able to be the community. We rejoice with the praises that were in the comments. We pray with the prayers that were in the comments. And hey, if you've got any prayer requests, if you've got any concerns, man, reach out to the church office. We are here for you in this time. And even more than that, too. If you know somebody who maybe can't watch on Facebook, we have DVDs that we would love to make to send to people. And if you want to send them to your neighbor, if you want to just put it you know, by their front door, don't even tell them you were there. Uh, we want to be the church. We want to be reaching out in this time. But we are so excited that we were able to come together as a community today. And we couldn't have done that without you. So, friends, hear this benediction and go in God's peace, knowing that he's with you and he will never leave you during this time. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and from this place. And may you be comforted by his grace, mercy, and love all the days of your life. Amen. Amen.